If you had to guess, would you say that our system is pretty well buttoned up and secure? If something can be engineered, it can be reverse engineered. There is no such thing as an impervious silver bullet. Hi, I'm Ed D'Agostino, and this week my favorite cybersecurity expert joins us to talk about the latest attempts by foreign governments and hackers to impact the U.S. election. Kareem Hajazi is the founder of cybersecurity firm Vigilocity, and he joins us this week on Global Macro Update from Malden Economics. Kareem, good to see you, man. Appreciate you joining us again. Our last conversation was so fascinating. I knew I had to have you back. And the topic for today probably couldn't be any more timely. I want to talk about what you're seeing on the front lines of cybersecurity when it comes to attempts at election interference in the United States. Uh, so, so before we dig into that in depth, can you tell me sort of how you define election interference, at least in your world of cybersecurity? Sure. Yeah. Great. Great to be back, Ed. Thanks for having me. And, and uh, yes, absolutely. Very, very dynamic space, very dynamic issue, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a broad topic because you you, you know talk to different folks about it. Um, even, even if you talk to cyber folks like myself and others, they're going to have a different definition of what that is. Some people are definitively focused on the actual election we call it fraud or any kind of electronic interference with the actual voting machines and all that. That's been a very hot bed, hot topic, all that. That's where people kind of go immediately when they think about cyber. But there's a whole other side that is this election interference with regard to influence campaigns, leveraging social media, hacking into people's accounts and tweeting out from their accounts to get people sort of contorted in their views or just building a bot army that will deliver a message over and over and over until it seems like it's actually the majority saying something. So, again, tied to influence. So there's that. And then there's the whole uh, sort of threat of war and the cyber side of that, you know, where they're going after people's information. Like we saw, what was it, three and a half weeks ago, four weeks ago with regard to the Trump administration uh, or Trump campaign getting hacked. And then <laughs> the hackers trying to sell the information to the Biden side and vice versa. It's all over the place. So, yeah, so that's. I kind of have to, by the nature of what I do for a living, have to lump it all together under one umbrella and then compartmentalize each one of those aspects uh, as, as they relate to the threat as a whole. So how would you describe the seriousness of the threat this year? Because it, it, we don't seem to be hearing that much about it. Is it is it have we gotten it under control? I think that. The narrative has been managed better this time around, um, more than I would say that there's a true, you know, control of the problem, because really these are nation state actors on the other side that are trying to create dissension and division. And there's no way we're going to simply dis disincentivize them to, to not do it. Right? So they're doing it. Right? There's no question about it. I think what's going to be interesting now is to what degree that affects how how well that's working. Is there actually some sort of influence happening? I think that the answer is yes. I think people are being galvanized in, in both directions in a big way, not only by their own belief system, by what's being bolstered by these groups that are doing it. As far as the actual technical kind of impacting and getting into these systems, that's hard to figure out because I think the reality is the law enforcement agencies and the intelligence community um, it's in their best interest to keep that very locked up and very quiet, no matter how much it's happening or not happening. Letting people even have a sniff of the fact that that might be an issue is going to be a problem. So I think that, quite frankly, we're probably not going to hear much about what happened technologically to things like voting machines or the school districts that they use to set up voting machines in that could be hacked. There's this whole layered approach to how the bad guys are going to go after things. It's not just about the machine. It's about the conduits or the locations where these things are, what networks they're actually connecting to, what open Internet relays they have access to. And that's completely that's too technical for the mass, masses to understand. So most people just sort of keep that quiet. I don't think it's under control to give you a shorter ver version of the answer. I think that the narrative is managed. I think that, quite frankly, we haven't we've seen a little bit of what is yet to come. Not to be foreboding, but I think there's more to come. Interesting. It does seem like the reporting on this happens after the election. With intent. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For one way or the other to, to sort of bolster a an angle, whatever that angle may be for whatever side is saying it. I couldn't agree with you more. 
So you said something earlier. You said that that there's attempts at dissension and division, and that's really that's really the point of of most of the foreign actor, foreign government influence attempts in our country. It's not necessarily to to position one candidate ahead of another. It's to get us to fight in this country, right? Like that's the end game, right? That's it. It's it's a playbook. It's essentially it's a known tried and true method of kind of dismantling your your adversary is to create dissension in the ranks, you know, create division, um, wreak havoc, let them destroy each other themselves from the inside, which is sadly what has happened and continues to happen a little bit. You know, I've, I've been on several interviews that ask this exact question. What can we do to sort of stifle this or limit this? And the answer really is, unfortunately, more critical thinking, really looking at what you're reading and trying to sort of separate yourself from your convictions a bit, just so you can look at things a little bit more objectively. And that's hard for a lot of people. Yeah, it is not not fighting, but re- reminding yourself that uh, we have more in common than not in this country. Very true. Very true. Yeah. yeah. The sense of patriotism has sort of changed uh, and the definition of it sort of changed a bit. And And look, very plainly, bad guys take advantage of that fact. Yeah, they're doing a great job, it seems like, unfortunately. So let me get back on. I'll get back on topic here. Um, I've read about in in prep for this interview, I've read about three main state actors that have been the most active. Uh, And I don't think it'd be any surprise. Right. It's 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 China. It's Russia and also Iran uh, recently. And I think it was uh, uh, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik was saying in, in in a hearing that Iran had made inroads uh, in, in, in some hacking attempts, uh, had gotten pretty far, and the public hasn't been fully informed about it. Do, do, can you talk to any of those three state actors and sort of their MO and what they what you know they may have been have been doing uh, this this election cycle? Sure, sure. So certainly those those actors are are clearly the most prolific ones universally, whatever the agenda may be of, of at the, at the time. At the moment it's election, which is external, you know, very, very um, powerful. It's a powerful time for them to get control of one group or another and kind of manipulate and move things. But they're the same groups behind all the other intellectual property theft, the uh, defense industrial base hacks, the financial system attacks, so, so there's not really too much of a shift there. So what's interesting for, for teams like mine and other companies that do something along the lines of what we do, we're looking at what we call the TTPs of these groups, the techniques, tactics, and procedures of these groups. And we're comparing them against what we're seeing with the attacks on sort of, we'll call it the election apparatus. And that's how the same thing with government's doing is they're sort of saying, okay, we can kind of define that as probably likely this group or that group or this country or that country. Each one of those countries has their own sort of specialty and their methodology of how they do things. Uh, some are better than others. Uh, some are learning from the others a little bit. We've seen some team ups at times with them to, to go after certain things. We've seen some division and one group wants one thing to happen. Another group wants another problem is it's a government, right? So ultimately there isn't always one unified effort in these groups. There's various proxy militia that are at, that are leveraged as well. And what I mean by that, which makes this all the more complicated, is that you may have a nation state actor, one of the three that we mentioned, but we, they may be leveraging a nation or a, a hacker group or call it a cyber crime group somewhere else completely to facilitate the attack to completely confuse and, and, and make it all the more un, un, unclear about who's really behind it. So there's this whole cloak and dagger. I think we even said this in our last podcast together. There's a world, you know, kind of a world of, of, of espionage and um, cloak and dagger cold war 2.0 sort of manifested now where there's proxy militias, there's double agents, there's the whole bit that's happening. And to add insult to injury on this, the concept of putting co- like long-term covert agents into our society is back. Those, those actual people on the ground that are doing certain things that need to be closer to the target to facilitate that are there as well. It's not exactly cyber, but they are facilitating access to things that otherwise are hard to get to from afar. So that's that's also happening. So it was sort of old school right. spy, sp- spy tactics are back. Yeah. Tradecraft is back in, in, in vogue. I was reading about the Foreign Malign Influence Center. 
founded in 2022. Uh, and and their, their job is to defend elections against outside influence. Um, but they've only got a couple dozen staff, I read. It, it feels like they're, they're, uh, they're very understaffed given the size of the job. And, um, it, it also feels like, uh, it, it feels like our approach to this challenge and, and cyber in general, cybersecurity is overly decentralized. Uh, wh- what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. I'll even go a step further. And this is going to sound very contrarian from a guy like me, but our reliance on technology now has almost hobbled our ability to handle what we'll call low tech, low and slow methodology, like what we're referring to with some of these long term coverts or um, the rumor mill that could be started by one sort of group and trickle this out among uh, a group of people. Now, mind you, they're still using technical tools for that, like social media. The problem is we're not equipped to work backwards against those threats. We've gone so heavily technical that we we this is actually very similar to a problem that existed during the whole hunt for bin laden where drones aren't going to see inside caves they're not going to be able to find guys that are running around under the, the cover of night and with with dust you know storms that are there unbelievable you'd think that that would actually stifle or hobble our, our equipment but it does and and so very similar situation when it comes to what we believe is going to be the end all be all of being able to have intelligence apparatus collect Tried and true human intel is still very, very much needed. It's still actually the foundational uh, skill that really good hackers use. They social engineer their way into things. And we've sort of lost that skill over the years because of how technically advanced we've become. And then what's made this even more complicated, and I know this is sort of bundling a whole lot into one answer here, AI is now becoming this all seeing all knowing oracle of of knowledge that's going to save our our skin and i really don't think we're there yet (laughs) and i think it's going to be this unfortunately very eloquent incorrect answer that we're going to take and i don't think that's the way to go so you're saying that we we basically need to get back in the game that our adversaries are playing we need to have not not boots on the ground but spies on the ground 100 percent. and i think that the problem we have today is nothing's going to happen between now and the election Nothing's really going to happen from between now and I would say several years from now when it takes time to get that kind of thing built. That's not an overnight kind of build out. I do think it works in unison and hand in hand with high tech means of surveillance and, and, and all that, but it's one's not going to simply trump the other. And I, and that's a, again, you know, I know I normally talk about the, I advocate for technology, I advocate for countermeasure technology against bad technology. But in this particular case, Humans are the weak point, but they're also a really strong point if we can imbue them with that capability. So, yeah, I I think as a collective nation, we have to kind of think about that again and start fostering that. We we literally have to go back to what it was like during the 80s, uh, the Reagan era, where, where that kind of that group was extremely powerful on our side. We had massive capabilities in terms of intelligence collection, and we didn't rely exclusively on technical means to collect it. Going at it from the cyber perspective. You're, we all know that there's misinformation and disinformation being spread by bad actors. We see that. We all live that. What people like, like me don't see, but that you do are, are, are the more back end technical, uh, trying to get into a voting machine. If you had to guess, would you say that our system is pretty well buttoned up and secure at this point from those types of threats? This is a really um, polarizing and and slightly controversial answer. If something can be engineered, it can be reverse engineered. There's just a simple math when it comes to that. Um, There is no such thing as an impervious silver bullet, perfectly defended device. In fact, as I was alluding to earlier in this conversation, you've got the voting machine. Okay, you can arm that up. You can harden it as much as you possibly can. You can try to audit the code till the cows come home until this thing looks like it's absolutely perfectly unbuttoned up to the point where nothing is going to happen. The problem is it still has to connect out to an insecure environment effectively to convey 
what it's collecting. And even if it doesn't, someone still has to collect something from the machine. It has, something has to move. Um, so therein lies the problem with it. And ironically, it's so funny you asked that question as the next one in line, because if they're not going to get to it through technical means to find their way through the network into the machine, they'll get to it through an individual that can easily be manipulated to give them that information from it or allow that information to be manipulated with a USB key or some sort of access to the physical machine in some way. So I hate to say this because I know there's a lot of people that want to truly believe that we've, you know, kind of taken all the time and effort to harden them. And we probably have, that does not make them impervious to that type of threat. So I, I would go toe to toe with anyone that would suggest that, that these things are absolutely impervious. That's it's not the case. That's how I feel about life in general right now. I mean, if you expand this conversation out to kind of what we talked about on our, a few months ago, I mean, it's every day now that you that you're getting some sort of notice from a company that you had an account with years ago and 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 now your social security number and you, all your past addresses like my mortgage company recently sent me a note hey just checking in oh and by the way we we, we all of your personal information all of it was hacked what is a fix i mean like i i feel like companies are entrusted with with really important individual people's information. And, and if that information gets out, some people's lives are literally ruined. Very much so. Um, because through financial fraud or identity theft and, 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 and all the, the results. What has to change in order to get companies and entities and local governments and every, all, all these different entities, what, what is, has to change to get them to take it seriously and, and protect this data? Or is it just a losing battle? Well, I think the problem here is that it comes back down to the individuals that this finally gets in front of that are that are duped into sharing information with these criminals. It's pretty funny. Ed, um, I found a, a spam text message. Uh, that was saying in the text message that my data had been stolen and to go check this record out of this collection information that was stolen. And that link went to a thing to steal my information. So they were using a notice to me that something had gone wrong to lure me into checking it to then effectively dupe me into into. So it's layer upon layer upon layer, you know, of, of these guys doing things that are very clever to get in into your uh, into your environment. As far as how companies look at this, and, and this is a, a little bit of indictment, broadly speaking, and not specific to any one company or the other, it has to make sense financially for them to do it. Um, you know, I don't know how much we got into this in the last conversation. This holds true for um, OT, operational technology, like refineries and like electrical grids. These are private organizations that don't see a return on their investment to fix some of these problems. I hate to say it that way, but it is a financial decision. And it's frankly, a cost, right? it's a cost, right? And if yeah. compliance failure means a fine of X amount of dollars, that's where the CFO goes, hang on a minute. The fine is X amount. The cybersecurity required and the training of our staff and everything else is Y. And Y is exponentially more money than X. We're going to pay the fine. We're going to do all that work. And and that's sadly the, the reality behind so, sort of the, the motivation behind this. So altruistically, yes, they should be doing a lot more, you know, all that, but Hey, you know, much of the, much of the people that listen to this podcast, we're all businessmen. We do think about both sides of the equation, but sometimes the all powerful dollar wins. Uh, admittedly, we all have cut corners to, to, to turn and turn a dime. And that's unfortunately what these organizations are doing. It's only when they're pressurized, Ed, that they start to make those changes. And uh, that's unfortunately Sadly, again, where I make my living, usually I get called after the facts. Uh, uh, and even though I've shared a little bit of the proclivity for them to have a problem, usually I'm getting the call after it's happened. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I am gonna, one of the last people that's going to say we need a regulation, um, but but I do think we need a level playing field, right? Like like if if every company that has data of any type that is sensitive has to be on the same playing level playing field, at least they would all hopefully do it. Right. Right. And that's a, that's a little bit of what the SEC was trying to push forward last December with their four day rule around breach. If you're a public company and, and you had a material breach, that's, of course, the therein lies the the, the clincher. Right. What's material? 
we can get into that for an hour. Uh, but ultimately that was, that was the goal is if we can have reporting of these from these public companies about a breach within a four day period through, you know, their, uh, through the Edgar system to be able to have a, a proper uh, indication, they could alert the victims. They could sort of stifle this thing from growing any bigger. It hasn't taken shape the way I think we all thought it would. Same with every other regulation, be it HIPAA, be it Sarbanes-Oxley, be it, you know, GLBA, if you remember that one from way back when, or even GDPR, which is, you know, the European one that, that, that obviously has had more teeth than most. But even with that, that hasn't necessarily stopped people from paying the fine or made them push them toward trying to be more secure inherently. Yeah, it's yeah unfortunate. People are, uh, it, you know, individuals are just getting desensitized to it. Which yeah. is to the to the company's benefit. That's right. That's exactly right. And you look, myself included, Ed. If I have a credit card that's stolen, I don't think twice about it, really, other than calling the credit card company and getting a net re, reissued card. The charges are reversed, and I just I don't really think much about it. The problem is, think about that times X. You're just talking about it a substantial amount of money being being shoveled into the threat actor's hands, and um, it's pretty it's pretty dramatic. And then. This comes back to full circle to our election concerns and we'll call it threat actors that have a more malicious intent in, involved. Many of these groups are not just simply hackers for hire that are going to try to profit. Many of them are terroristic in nature. If money gets in their hands, you're feeding a terroristic activity. And that's where things get really precarious and scary. What do you think the future of uh, personal data security is? And 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 if I could add to that. Um, I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago about how I, I personally think that quantum computing is, is the next big thing. Uh, we, you know, might be years away still, but I, as an investor primarily, um, I think that's the space that people should be looking at. You know, everyone is looking at AI over here. I think it's time for early investors and speculators to be saying there's something happening in a quantum. Uh, does quantum change everything? And if not, where do you think things go? I think it changes everything in phases. Um, you know, one of the the best lay terms I heard about quantum is uh, was coined in, in from that sneakers movie with Robert Redford, Sidney Poitier, years ago, if you remember it from the 80s. Great film. And uh, in the movie, uh, no more secrets was the sort of tagline. And the whole, if you remember that, it's great. It's a good, good sleeper film. But um Really fundamentally, what this represents is the ability to take anything that was formerly encrypted or codified or hidden and make it freely readable by any, by a machine, which is which would have otherwise taken thousands, if not millions of years to decrypt. Now it can be done, which is where, where quantum has this dramatic shift beyond, beyond the simply being able to do something much faster than what conventional machines can do today. That's the implications from the cybersecurity angle. So just to kind of fill in the audience. The, the, the cybersecurity qu impacts from quantum are that it is the ability to decrypt things that were otherwise meant to be encrypted. And that changes everything that changes blockchain, that changes cryptocurrency, that changes every password you have. It changes everything. So so that is a really dramatic, dramatic shift. So, yes, from an investment standpoint, it's incredibly interesting. Of course, just like anything that has this, you know, huge potential to, to change things, which ones are going to take the lead on it. You know, we watched this whole um, race to, to the to the finish line with AI for the most part. I don't say it's over by any stretch of the imagination, but they're the leaders in the space. Now we know who they are. A lot of investors put their money behind a lot of these sort of, we'll call it copycat wrapper technology that wrapped around the other big guys stuff. And they lost out. Unfortunately, this is sort of the nature of the beast. Quantum is going to be interesting because it's expensive, right? It's not going to be as quite as easily to get into. Um, I don't think small companies are just going to magically create some quantum thing overnight. Like, like some of the big guys might be able to do. Um, and then of course, this is the classic case from my perspective with why I've been in business for 30 years doing this kind of work Every time there's an advancement technologically, the first group that generally gets hold of it and runs with it is, are the bad guys. <laughs> so they tend to leverage it the most effectively and frankly, the most creatively in most cases. And it's the good guys that sort of trail behind trying to figure out, oh, well, they did that. I guess we need to build a counter to that. And then they sort of go, the, they go down this, this road. So we'll see, we'll see history repeat itself with quantum. 
Uh, I don't think it's terribly far away to your point. I don't think it's another 10, 20 years away. I think it's closer. Um, at least the earliest stages of, of seeing that, that, uh, the usage of it. Definitely. But hearing everything that you just said, I mean, that is the ultimate, that's the, that is the holy grail for, uh, a, a foreign government, like the first big foreign government to crack quantum runs the table essentially. That's it. It, it, And no kidding. It literally, that was the, that was the plot of that movie sneakers from the eighties. Right. So when that movie came out, they were, they were foreshadowing what was going to ultimately happen. Once something like that comes into place, it's literally our, it's sort of the cybersecurity's George Orwell book of 19, you know, 1984 for us going, that movie articulates what will happen eventually. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a very good, um, indication. It's glamorized, but effectively very similar to what it will do. You pointed at something that is meant to be codified or encrypted and it'll decrypt it for you. And you're going to have the keys to the kingdom to your point. Seems like that's a huge area of vulnerability that we're probably given, given what we're doing with AI or not mm-hmm. doing with AI in terms of regulation. Uh, that's a yeah. scary, that's a scary concept. And, and that war, um, that sort of secret war around quantum has been waging for a lot longer than most people realize the, in particular, the Chinese have made tremendous advances. Um, they've infiltrated our universities way back. They've been able to harvest a lot of the intellectual property around the AI, or excuse me, around the quantum tech that we've built or we've come up with. And so to what degree or are they ahead or they behind? It's, it's sort of anyone's guess. There's a lot of speculators that say they're ahead of us. We'll see. But but yeah, so this is definitely nothing that is just starting. Uh, This is definitely something that's been going on for quite some time. And so the fruits of that intellectual harvest, intellectual property harvesting are going to start to to bear fruit one way or the other, whether it's our adversaries or or us. And it's going to be another uh, another race to the finish there as well. And we'll see that sort of manifest soon. So it makes sense, right? It, 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 if it takes massive amounts of dollars, and it, and it does, to move quantum forward, uh, you know, it, it, you need a large company, or lar- I'm sorry, a large country to be able to fund that. These are some key areas among everything else you can probably come up with, whether it be energy policy or, um, you know, just, just trade. But, but quantum and technology are the underbelly at this point of just about all of those things. And so I think, quite frankly, our threat actors looking at the election and choosing which candidate they're effectively going to back, at least based on their dissension creation or their division creation with their their audience, is probably the one they can manipulate or further deteriorate so that the country doesn't have strength to stand on when they are advancing themselves. So you got to look at the long game with this. It's definitely much more. This is the classic sort of. Um, uh, forecasting story that with other guests that will probably say very similar things that I'm saying the long game with this is the one that we need to look at with the, the election attacks here. This is definitely nothing to simply get someone in today that they like better than the next. That's not it at all. This is about long-term control of this country from the bottom up effectively is what I think is really happening. Your point about energy policy, that's a, that's a great analogy. When you just look at where are we at in this country where we, there's a, there's a large portion of the country that wants to electrify. Um, we are sw- arguably swimming in oil. We have a lot of it, but how many nuclear, how many nuclear power plants do we have being built in this country right now? I think it's none. Last time I counted, um, China has dozens. China's miles ahead of us on, on solar. Um, right. Just yeah. they're playing a different game. They are. They are. And they got themselves very in the, the painful sore spot for me and a lot of other folks in this business. Power grids, right? I know this is a sort of a tired topic, but I, I, I keep bringing it up because unfortunately, I won't get into the minutia of it. And I promise not to make this another belabored topic around the power grids going down. That's really not my point. What I'm actually going to talk about is the technology that we employ in some of these power plants, the one or the, the, the energy grids, they're built in China. And if they go down, we need the company in China to give us another one. <laughs> so I'm not even talking about a nation state hacking it. I'm talking about our replacement for what we have today is not actually in country. And it's horrifying concepts because now, you know, essentially 
we're, we're really, uh, we're pressurized there. And I think that's going to make things, it's funny because the power plants are effectively what are going to feed something like a quantum uh, cluster somewhere. If we don't have the energy, quantum clusters don't work. So you, you bring up an excellent point about having a large enough organization or sorry, country to fuel these, these technolo- the technological advancements. And if they can hobble us at the source of, of, of where things are going to be generated, it's why Canada got a lot of the Bitcoin mining stuff in the early days because they had a very stable infrastructure. They had cool weather to keep the machines cold. <laughs> they had a lot of interesting geographic and environmental factors that made it better a better investment to put it up there. Funny things like that. So that's probably going to come into play here as well. And cheap, cheap, abundant hydropower. Very much so. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So you're on the front lines with all this stuff, which I just think must be so fascinating, terrifying, I would think, but fascinating. I hope you sleep at night. <laughs> tell me, tell me what's going on with you. Like what, what's happening with Vigilosity as a company and, and, and what are you seeing frontline that maybe is new since you and I spoke last? Yeah, no, it's, it's, I couldn't agree with you more. It's exhilarating. Uh, and at times a little bit, um, foreboding and, and precarious because certainly, you know, my job and what we do at, at the company is quite a bit different than most people do within cybersecurity. We're actually going and Im- impacting the threat actors, right? And that's a very, very interesting uh, place to be. Um, what's probably the most interesting thing as of late and what I've, what I've done and what we've been advancing since I talked to you last is that we now actually see the material uh, that is being stolen by these threat actors from the organizations they've impacted. And why that was important is that you remember when we were referring to the SEC and needing to know about material breach and is it material? Is it not? If it is, then you need to report it within four days. Well, you know, the, the loophole there was, well, we don't really know if it's material or not. We didn't even really know it existed. What we're doing sort of takes that out of the equation. We're saying, no, well, we're kind of an overwatch capability that can tell you that you have something there if you didn't know about it already. And not only can we tell you how something there now we can tell you that you had something leave your organization that may be material. Here it is. It's a PDF file. It's an Excel file. It's your earnings report two days, two weeks early, whatever that's material. And so not only is that very interesting from a public company perspective, but you can imagine what this looks like from a defense standpoint or governmental standpoint, the kind of data that flows through our system. So unfortunately it's a little bit of a Pandora's box, we get to see a lot of things we probably wouldn't want to see if we had the choice. And so a lot of this has to do with stewarding that information in the right direction. It's got to either go to the right organizations that are being impacted so they can make a judgment call on what's actually leaving, what's not. Um, so, um, and it makes the company a very attractive target, both for the bad guys. They don't like me very much, but also for uh, good guys and companies that want to acquire that capability. So I've been very fortunate. Um, Innovation is interesting. Ed, we talked about it last chat about how I'm a huge advocate for trying to keeping keeping innovation fostered here in this country. It's incredibly important. Um, please, you know, desperately when it comes to your politicians, don't 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 make choices that that really de- de- take the, the wind out of the sails of, of innovators because we're just going to lose. Uh, you're going to lose them. They're going to go to different countries. They're going to be enticed to go to places that, that they will be paid for it. So um I'm seeing that in a big way as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my day to day these days. I think the next step in the equation is working closely with government to, uh, counter, uh, measure and essentially counter attack, uh, these, these threat actors. I can't do it as a private company disclaimer, but I can certainly give them the targeting packages so they can do it themselves, which is very interesting. You can point to it and say, here's exactly what happened. Here's what was taken. Here's how you can get in. You can you can do everything except actually facilitate the entry. That's right. Exactly. I can't do the government's job. But what I do, which is really interesting and probably more interesting to your audience here, the data I collect while very much a cybersecurity product is more interesting to companies like cyber insurance companies that can figure out who's worthy of a policy and who's not. It's interesting to hedge funds that want to know who might actually show up on the front of the New York Times uh, in advance of them showing up on the New York, the front of the New York Times for shorting the stock, for example. So there's a lot of, um, we'll call it profit center uses of the intelligence, not just the cost center, the cybersecurity cost center that we talked about earlier on. Kareem, always fascinating chatting with you. I really appreciate your time. These uh, these updates are really important. This is a topic that that 
people just don't hear about enough. So I, I hope you come back on a regular basis and we can we can keep these updates going. Would love to. Be great. Great seeing you, Kareem. Same here, Ed. Talk to you soon. Go to globalmacroupdate.com to sign up for my free newsletter. Every week, you'll receive a link to our latest video, a transcript, and my occasional notes on the challenges and opportunities that I see developing in the markets, all based on the interviews that you see here. Again, I'm Ed D'Agostino. Thanks for joining me.